Sometimes I get so close. And yet it seems I'm shut out of the important things. It's a useless feeling. The ambassador is definitely going through some changes. He even looks different. Indeed. And now with the military starting to stampede over everyone and everything. People coming and going and secret meetings. You never know what it's all about until later when it's too late. They never listen to us. It makes me nervous. Same time tomorrow? Sure. It was the end of the Earth year 2259 and the war was upon us. As anticipated a few days after the Earth's Centauri Treaty was announced, the Centauri widened their war to include many of the non-aligned worlds. And there was another war brewing closer to home, a personal one whose cost would be higher than any of us could imagine. We came to this place because Babylon 5 was our last best hope for peace. By the end of 2259, we knew that it had failed. But in so doing, it became something greater. As the war expanded, it became our last best hope for victory. Because sometimes peace is another word for surrender. And because secrets have a way of getting out. The war that will decide the fate of the galaxy. You will not survive. Is about to begin. Watch everything we've got. On the next Babylon 5. You have transmissions holding. Patch incoming signal. Full audio and video decode. Purple files accessed. What you are about to see has never been shown to anyone outside the break house. there in podcast land welcome to gray 17 a babylon 5 podcast a part of the front row network and npr illinois community voices we are a group of newbies and first one some of us are watching the show for the very first time and some of us have watched it all the way through and then some we are here on episode number 44 which means this is the season finale of season two so if you are joining us for the first time, and I'm sure several of you are, because we always have people pile on when we have a big episode, welcome. And just so you're aware how this works, we will have our newbies talk about the entire episode, but we will not discuss what happens next. So anything after the end of season two, we will not discuss with the newbies because they haven't seen it yet and we don't want to spoil them. And then once the newbies give us their questions and predictions, we will have them leave and then us first ones who have watched the whole show will then get into spoiler talk. And you can imagine that um, there's going to be some spoiler talk with this episode. So we're going to start talking about the fall of night. But before I do, I'm Scott. And with me is Emily, Nicole, Blake, Andrew, Kevin, Justin, and Mike. A reminder to everybody, please check out all our social media. We have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. We are also, if you're listening to the audio version of this, we're on YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube, we do have an audio podcast. All the links are down below. We also have merch, which is linked below, and we have our Patreon. So if you want to help the show grow, you can join that. We have options from $3 a month all the way up to our Gray Council at $20 a month. Our Gray Council are our producers, and they are listed down below as well. Anyone who joins the Patreon can join our Discord server, and we do have both a general discussion for the newbies to be a part of. And we have a beyond the rim discussion for those who want to talk spoilers there. The last thing I have for you to do is please make sure you subscribe, follow, like whatever your app does and click that thumbs up button. And if you're on YouTube, click that notify button. So you know, when we do have new episodes drop. And finally, please, 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 if you can leave us a review, the reviews really help us grow. We just had our best day ever. And we continue to see that the growth of this thing is just through the roof. And we really appreciate it. And a big part of that is because the reviews do help us get disseminated out to search engines and all that. So we did get another 
five-star review in from Apple iTunes, and I'll read that real quick here. It comes from Miggy Mac. Miggy Mac says, who are you and what do you want? With the JMS buzz, something big happening next week, I thought there's got to be a podcast out there about B5. Bing, 12 episodes this weekend, and I'm anticipating the ride through the rest of the series. And what Miggy is referring to actually happened last week because we record these a few weeks in advance. And that is the announcement that we have all been waiting for. And if you've been a member of JMS's Patreon, you've known this for a little bit longer than most. There has been a secret project in the works since 2021. And in fact, it's been in the can, so it's done. It is completely ready to go. And that announcement was made a few weeks ago that there is a Babylon 5 animated movie coming out from Warner Brothers. And we actually don't know more about that than that because, again, we're recording this on May 7th. However, on May 10th, so in the past for you, in the future for us, we're going to get more information from Warner Brothers of what that anime and movie looks like. So actually, again, in the future for us, in the past for you, we did a live recording with the League of Non-Aligned Podcasts where we had a whole bunch of different podcast crews come together and talk about that announcement some more. So you can find that both uh, audio bonus version on our podcast as well as in our YouTube under the live section. So check those out as we talk more about that anime and movie. And the newbies, as I've discussed with you already, you're just going to have to wait and see if you can watch the movie until after we've watched the movie because we'll then know <laughs> where, because we don't even know where it falls into the timeline here. And we'll discuss all this when we can discuss it. But is it a side gig? Is it something that actually follows up on something else? We just don't know yet. Until we know, the newbies must say virgins and be good and not check out anything else so well, scott we we actually talked about this last week while you were off on your uh oh yeah i wasn't here adventure and one of the things just interesting from that is we talked a little bit with our newbies and jesse in particular um, who's unfortunately not with us tonight but the from where jesse was in season one to the fact that she's excited for the idea of an animated movie coming out now yeah yeah that, the progression of that one alone that's that's amazing, isn't it? And we, we yeah. kind of knew it, didn't we, guys? The new the first ones we knew it's a little bit of a slog, and we told you all that. But we're I'm really happy that all of you have, in one shape or form, bought in at this point. And as we've just already been discussing before we started recording, season three, uh, Nicole joked said, "Hey, I've got 26 pages left in my notebook for notes. How much could that get me into season three? And Blake said, eh, "About halfway through episode one." <laughs> so, it, we're just getting started, folks. But yeah, I mean, it's exciting time for Babylon 5. This is the first new Babylon 5 project in over two decades. And that means also, as the announcements keep rolling, more of you are going to be joining us for the first time. So welcome. We're really excited to have you. And with uh, same with Miggy Mac and how they joined us. Enjoy the, uh, the 44 episodes plus the bonus episodes we've done. And bear with us. The first couple episodes are kind of rough. Judging by some of the one-star reviews I'm looking at right here, I, I would agree with that too. But if you get through those first couple episodes, I think it's a fun ride. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's go ahead and dive into The Fall of Night. I know Justin has a synopsis, but first, I've got to do something here. Because Justin, buddy, we had a little fun with you a few weeks ago. So I actually have the recording of us gaslighting the shit out of you. And I would like to play that just so everyone rem remembers how much shit we gave you. And actually, too, I've actually pulled a little bit of a snippet from Beyond the Rim. So you'll be able to hear what we had to say after you all left, too. So I'm going to pull that up real quick. And then, Justin, you can tell us how we're all assholes. Okay? <clears throat> and here we go. Am I the only one that noticed in the scene with uh, Lita and Tosh that there was a flapping of wings? And I honestly, over. when when Lita asked Kosh to reveal himself, I heard a flapping of wings, which makes me think the Vorlons are angelic creatures. Where which... are you on edibles? <laughs> <laughs> no, but my prediction. Angel boy, is that your only prediction? Apparently, because evidently I'm wrong. So carry on. <laughs> we'll discuss it beyond the rim, I guess. <laughs> we didn't say you were wrong. We just said you imagined it. <laughs> <laughs> in your mind 100 percent true <laughs> angels god i hate you fuckers so much <laughs> and here is the never heard by the newbies beyond the rim reaction to justin yes yes and what did she see 
Justin, when you listen to this again, two years from now, she saw an angel. Sorry, we gaslit you. <laughs> we did. But okay, I knew so, the payoff is coming in three episodes, yeah, so I felt sure. like I could. I'm, I'm just waiting, though, until you know they figure that part out, and then they get all the Touched by a Vorlon references. <laughs> <laughs> I am absolutely going to put out a meme when we drop this episode of the Aliens guy saying angels just to play with justin a little bit more uh but yeah no she's and justin uh called it out and i i can't remember if i called it out on the beyond the rim or not but uh, i know mike you haven't heard this because you mentioned that every time kosh comes out of his encounter suit you absolutely do hear flapping wings justin's right it is a part of the sound mix and in the air absolutely there every time if you listen for him you hear the flapping wings well and we all have commented before we were surprised that no one picked up on that earlier but this is the first time that even Justin picked up on it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, you know, I mean, Andrew's not far off with the non-corporeal. I mean, he's right. definitely a being of light, but he has a figure. Right. And depending on who you are, you see a different figure, which we will get into. And I'm looking forward to that episode, The Fall of Night. It comes soon, folks. It will be here soon. And it's here. So, Justin, with that, please give us your synopsis. All right. What had happened was Kepper fuck, fucked around and found out regarding the spider murder ships. The bullshit Ministry of Peace is back, and Nightwatch is doing more training on how to be Gestapo. Earth shows its ass and signs a treaty with the with the Centauri, putting themselves on the wrong side of history in B5 in an impossibly awkward position. And lastly, Tosh is forced to reveal himself to a group of people, and the most important revelation of this episode is that Justin's a fucking genius. <laughs> 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 I felt kind of bad when we gaslit the shit out of you, but it was worth it for the laugh, was it not? It, well, oh, it was great, and I mean, I mean, and honestly, I didn't expect to get the answer so soon. I was thinking like way further down the road, will I eventually find out if I was right or not? So you know, and that's what people won't see um, because this is an audio podcast. But the very next episode that we recorded, I made a copy of a meme that I, I think I eventually posted it on Facebook. But saying with the guy sitting there saying the origins are, you know, the the, the Vorlons or angels proved me wrong or something like that. So it was I, I definitely had fun bantering back and forth about it. But at the end, it was like, wow, OK, I was fucking right. I screamed. I'm like, oh my god, I was right when I saw that happen. <laughs> Maybe the only time in this podcast I was correct with a prediction, so I'm owning it. Well, this is the first time we've been able to, you know, point out you were right, so read into that as you will. So let's go ahead and get into our first impressions from our newbies, and let's go to Emily first. First impressions on the fall of night. We got a lot of information, which was nice, and I don't know if I'm just having a bad week or what, but I just wasn't feeling it. It wasn't a bad episode. There's nothing I can pinpoint that's like, hey, this was terrible. Although the whole angel form thing was kind of hokey. I don't know. But yeah, I don't know. I just wasn't, I wasn't digging it. Second week in a row, it feels weird. And I don't know if it's just because we're finally getting information, but I can't watch ahead. So I'm just stuck in this like purgatory. It feels like purgatory. I'm just stuck. Like, great. Thanks. I hate you. It happens. I will say, you may not be the only one not feeling it, but you're one of the few because this was nominated for a Hugo Award. So, and actually JMS uh, turned down yeah. the nomination because he learned his lesson from last time. Remember we talked about this last time with the Hugo Awards and how two B5 uh, episodes were nominated and they almost split the votes and so they had to pull it back and all that. So this one, The Coming of Shadows was nominated for a Hugo and The Fall of Night. And so he actually d- turned down the nomination for, for Fall of Night. And the movie that got nominated in its place was a little movie called 12 Monkeys. So I think you you got a little hill to die on there, Emily. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Nicole, first impressions. Uh, this was a great episode. Um, first of all, I do feel a little guilty that I talked shit about Keffer this whole season because he kind of got got at the end. <laughs> um <laughs> So I feel kind of bad now, Um, but it was really cool. We got a lot of information. We finally got to see Kosh, which was awesome. Um, And I was kind of like, oh, shit, Justin was right when I was watching it, too. Like, because at first I was confused. I'm like, wait, what's happening? And all of a sudden, oh, oh, okay, I get it. And then when Sheridan asked him if it was him and he nodded, I was like, 
oh my god so i'm like yelling at the tv i'm highlighting and writing in caps like it's crazy um but i just really thought this was overall a great episode there was a lot of things going on a lot of action a lot of people that are on my shit list after this episode um it also was a really i feel like the only one who was missing was dr franklin but everyone else had a pretty integral part in this episode um so there was a lot uh it was really cool to see basically everybody be involved in this episode, especially being such a huge episode. Um, but I have a lot of questions, predictions and thoughts um, because there's a lot of shit that went down in this episode. Um, and I actually watched it and then I was taking notes and then I rewatched it right away after because I feel like I, I missed some stuff, you know, as I was going through because I was like writing everything down so frivolously and um, or furiously, I should say, not frivolous, but um yeah, it was it was a really good episode. Um, what a hell of a way to end the season. And now I'm like dying to watch the next episode. So great episode. And we'll definitely talk a little bit more about Space Jesus when we get into conversation, because I know our first ones have been chomping at the bit for literally a season to talk about Space Jesus. So we'll get to that. Andrew, first impressions. Holy shit. That's all I got. <laughs> good talk. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate it. And Justin, you can gloat some more if you like. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stoop to your guys' level. Um, oh, I, oh, shit. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> um, Cannon fired. Okay. Uh, so I, um, I just actually just thought of another question for later on. So I just wanted to jot it down real quick, but the, um, yeah, Emily didn't feel this episode. I felt it the fuck up. I really can't say anything bad about it, to be honest with you. Just all of the, this is one of those episodes where we get a lot of, some, we get them sometimes where they're the A, pol, uh, a plot and B plot are a little dis disjointed and kind of all over the place. This is one with me that it felt like everything was meshing together into one coherent story. I really enjoyed it. It, it I mean, it tickled my conspiracy theory, you know, bone, it tickled my Vorlon bones, it tickled my, it just, it, it, it hit me in all the right ways. So I absolutely love this episode and that's all I'll say for now. And let's go to our first ones. First uh, up is Blake impressions. For this episode, I think Justin kind of just touched on it amongst other things that apparently he's feeling up this evening. But yeah, I think this episode is one I enjoy because it's kind of that writing style of JMS of, it starts off like just a run of the mill episode. And it's not the first time he's done this either. And then just all of a sudden, it's like, you know, the writing sneaks up behind you and just hits you with here we are in the story. And it jumps in with you've got the Narn Cruiser, you've got that whole bit, you've got and it just takes off. But when you start into it, you don't see any of that coming. You don't expect that that's where it's going to head when things start out with the episode. So I think the writing in it is really good. I like the story of this one. So sorry, Emily, this is all this is one of my favorite episodes as we really get uh, going. Kevin, first impressions. I'm all about guest stars, and this one has Roy Dotrice in it, um, and it has John Vickery, who is playing a different part in this one, um, but uh, it's a great episode. It's it's certainly, it's huge for uh, getting information uh, that everyone's been waiting for for a long time, uh, you, you know, knowing more about the Vorlons, knowing... Um, you know, seeing seeing some real action. You know, with first some some um, exercises for the the Star Furies, and then some some real battle uh, stuff going on. And I realize that the scene with with Kosh, you know, looks a little hokey. You know, in twenty twenty three, but it was really difficult to film. It took an entire day, mm -hmm. um, and I'll say more about it. And I'm sure the other guys will too, but. Um, you know, you, you got to look through it through that lens a little bit and not just look through it through the 2023 lens, because uh, at the time it was it was pretty groundbreaking, especially for television. It's a it's a great episode for the newbies. Did anyone notice who John Vickery is, who he plays aside from the smarmy Night Watch guy? Naroon. Yeah. Our favorite little smarmy oh, Mimbari. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why I he, thought he looked he familiar. familiar to me. Yeah. Listen to the voice. Yeah. It's it's not the guy from Twin Peaks. It was Nerun. Makes sense why I wanted to punch him in the face. <laughs> For some reason, I thought he, uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but he was the star of David Lynch's adaptation of Dune. I yes. can't remember his name, though. Same guy. Like Kyle, I... 
Kyle something. Yeah, that's what I was talking about too for Twiz rolling Twin Peaks. They look alike. <laughs> they do. The and then Mike, first impression. Yeah, I love this episode. Um, you know, besides the the brief interaction in the beginning between uh, Veer and Lanier, which is comedic, but also not. Um, everything else in this episode is just pedal to the floor, and it, it it there's no fluff. It it advances multiple different plots all together and and I, I actually love i never really thought about it the way i don't forget who said it already but how it starts off as kind of a normal feeling episode and then you find out that the whole universe shifted on its axis by the time this thing was over um really really great you've got a a, a good mix of uh you know big old space mystery you've got a good mix of uh political satire um just just awesome so this this is one of my favorites yeah i'm sorry emily you're on your own because i love this episode too i think this entire season is kind of like a freight train moving into a crash and you have to stop and look at the tr- crash as it comes and even if you look at the names of the episodes we start at points of departure and every single episode is kind of building towards this moment where we have the fall of night and you guys even mentioned it in the intro how the great war came upon us all well we still haven't really seen the great war and that's the whole point this season was a hundred percent build up if season one is getting you to know the characters and getting you to know the story season two is building everything up for what happens next the bullet is in the gun and now it's time to be fired and i just love how this season ends and i'm looking forward to seeing what you all think about season three so let's go ahead and dive in and talk more about this episode and we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on so somebody just kick it off where do you want to go nicole i say let's start with sheridan and throughout this episode ship him go for it i will okay so first of all um he looked extra cute in this episode and i think he's kind of hot actually Uh, i just want to point that out um But that's not the important stuff. So I thought his um, steadfastness throughout this episode and his like, um, I thought he was really thinking about what he was doing. Like he was on the right side of of the moral spectrum in this episode. Um, He stood his ground. He wasn't afraid to stand to stand up to those Earth Alliance people. Okay, is it Lentz or Lentz? How did you say his name? I forget. You know, the Lentz. Lentz. Okay. Oh, I thought it was Lance. I really? thought it was Lance or Lance. Okay. So Lance and Wells come up in there and at first they're like, oh, good. They read my report. And then he realizes that they weren't actually helpful at all. And um, I really feel like he, I feel like as the last couple episodes, he's really been like establishing himself and like really showing his character. But I feel like this episode was like the pinnacle of all of that throughout this whole season. He even says to... Um, them that he followed the rules and the law and he did what he was supposed to do by helping the Narns because it is a sovereign area and it is in his jurisdiction. So he had the right to do that, you know, so he stood his ground. And then um, at the end, when he almost gets assassinated, he uh, encounters Kosh and all that. And I feel like that was a big turning point for Sheridan kind of leading the charge going forward. Um, So I thought this was a really, really big episode for him. Um, And just like overall, I I liked that he didn't compromise his moral standings and his, um, his like leadership skills. And like, he followed what he was supposed to do. So I have a lot more to say about a lot of the other things, but I figured we'll start with one thing and then go to it. But yeah, I just thought this episode really showcased him um, and his character and gave us an idea of what to expect from him coming forward. Nicole mentioned uh, Sheridan looking cute in this one. At the time we're recording this, our friends over at Yum Yum Pot actually tweeted a picture earlier today. of It's someone did a drawing of Sheridan in command and control sitting there at his desk with his uniform shirt open. And yeah, JMS basically responded that he was going to go uh, scrub his eyes with steel wool after seeing that one. So, Scott, you're not the only person who tweets GM- JMS and manages to get a response that basically is, oh, God, why are you bothering me? Yeah, but I do it more than once. <laughs> so I still feel vindicated. Emily, what do you got? Um, I was going to switch over to Londo because he pissed me off again. I mean, I was already angry a few episodes ago and I still angry and I'll probably be angry for a while but 
like his when Sheridan comes to him and is like what are you doing and he's like you can't talk to me like that it's like really dude oh my god I in trying to act like oh we're just creating this like little buffer zone around you know our world and we're not trying to expand and like we know you don't even believe the bullshit coming out of your mouth like you know it's shit we know it's shit but you have to stand here and say it like it's not complete shit and I just and that might be why I'm struggling with this episode because I would just ended up angry so angry at him Andrew yeah so speaking of Londo not believing in things uh all right, we're kind of getting more towards the end of the episode here, but uh, the fact that L- when they asked Londo what he saw when uh, when Kosh revealed himself and he said he didn't see anything, I'm not really sure what to make of that because, like, does that mean that, that he doesn't even believe in like 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 the Centauri religion and or like 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 I'm not really sure like what what exactly to make of that point. Yeah. So when asked, JMS responded with. Londo saw exactly what he said he saw, which was nothing. So you can read into it how you want to read to it. And I'm sure other folks want to talk about it. So I'll leave my opinions alone for right now. But Nicole, you're shaking your head emphatically. Yeah. So what do you got? So a couple things about Londo um, to kind of piggyback off what Andrew said, how he said he saw nothing. If you watch that scene when everybody was looking, you saw him look up with his eyes open and walk forward. So I think he did see something. I just think he said nothing because he's a bitter fuck face right now. Um, And I think that he's really, really spiraling down a negative space. And like just his interactions with Sheridan when, you know, he gave him such a hard time saying, I don't have to listen to you and then demanded to give the Narn ship over. Um, You know, if you look back to the last episode or maybe it was an episode before, but at the end when he was watching the news and they said the Centauri are closing in on all these other areas, you could see the look on his face like, oh shit. So I think deep down he doesn't agree with what's going on, but he's so, uh, I think it was Garibaldi who said that he's scared and he is kind of like wrapped up in it now. So he has to play his part in order to self, you know, preserve himself essentially. And I think Garibaldi hit it on the head because I do think, I still think Lando has a shred of decency in there. And I think that he maybe doesn't agree or maybe feels a little bad. And I do think he did see Kosh. I just think he's kind of playing the part. And I could be wrong. You're shaking your head at me, Scott. But that's just my interpretation of it. You know, I just, I just love throughout this process. And when people go back and listen, if you're joining us for the first time, the newbies have tried so desperately to find the good in Londo. And I get it. Londo's <laughs> a great character. Peter is an amazing actor. We all got to meet him. Hopefully we'll meet him. We'll talk to him again soon. But my God, he has even changed his wardrobe. He's wearing no, all yeah. black now. And yeah. even Veer in this episode says, I'm seeing physical changes. And then Nicole's like, I still think well, he's got a heart of gold. No, <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I said, I think there might still be a shred of decency underneath, but he's not going to show it and he's not going to follow it. Is he's going to... Sh- is that shred of decency before or after he launched asteroids at a planet? <laughs> but I'm just, okay. My <laughs> point is he saw something when he looked at Kosh. You can't deny that. Also, when in the very beginning of that scene, you saw everybody was paired up talking to somebody. He was in the corner by himself. Nobody was talking to him. No Nobody likes him. him. Right. That's what I'm saying. He and he feels that. behind a bush. Right. And then his BFF Garibaldi doesn't even talk to him anymore. Like he knows that he's alone. So I feel like he is kind of like, well, if I'm alone, fuck you all. I'm just going to fuck everything up now. You know what I mean? He's in a self uh, shame spiral for sure. And I definitely think he got in over his head and now he doesn't know how to get out of it. I'm not saying he's good. I'm not saying, but I think, I think his facial expressions and the way he acts and what he says doesn't always match. That's all I was trying to say. I will say that uh, he definitely saw Sinclair or Sinclair. He definitely saw Sheridan jump because that just happened. So maybe what you saw was him stepping yeah. forward, was watching Sheridan fall. And I could, yeah, I mean, I could be wrong, but also the look on his face, like everyone else's eyes kind of lit up and looked. And I saw that with him too. And maybe it it was, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel his good soul coming out of his eyes. Yeah, I just feel like he's, I feel like he saw something and he's lying. And also I have to say, 
Not all Centauri are pricks. I do love Veer, and I loved that veneer and um veneer, Veer and Lanier, <laughs> veneer. <laughs> Uh, I do love that shiny Vera. teeth. Yeah, I do love that Vera and Lanier um, scene, Mike, that you mentioned. That was one of my favorite things at the very beginning of the episode. And I like that they do that every week, like meet up, air their grievances and go about their business. So I thought that was really cute. But yeah, I don't know. I think that Lando has gone down a really dark path and I don't think it's going to end well for him. And everyone that he was friends with or cared about him has now turned on him, even Veer and he's on his own on a fucking island so i don't know i but i do think he might have saw something and he just won't admit it kevin what do you got it's awesome how this episode like so many others in the series you know are layered with historical parallels because um you know when you appease dictators and uh fascists this is what this is the kind of crap that happens i mean this is you know this is neville chamberlain saying oh well he's not that bad a guy and it's like yes of course the centauri are bad and here's exhibit a you know you you do that kind of crap and they're just gonna you know try to run the table and i i i love the writing because it it's you know it, it's brand new material but it it's just it's multi-layered and it's fantastic peace in our time kevin peace in our time good old never Ch- neville chamberlain right there yep which they they even quote in this in this episode yep peace in our lance said it mm-hmm. i mean yep. how you know we we can talk about the the other fuck face but you know lance is a complete piece of shit in this episode because not only does he come you know, seeming like he's going to do an investigation that he has no intention of doing, but he won't talk to Jakar, the person who ha- would have probably the most to say about what the Centauri are doing and won't talk to him at all. And then is entering into a uh, a non-aggression pact, which is just going to embolden the Centauri. I mean, it's just the most disgusting crap you can imagine. And it absolutely does embolden them this episode. Right. Emily, Emily, what do you got? Um, so to the point about Londo saying he saw nothing, I actually would have been wondering if he knew of the plot to assassinate Sheridan. Because how did they get um the device to do it? And while people are talking, he keeps looking at he's looking at his watch and like looking up and looking around. And it seems more than just annoyed at having to wait he seems agitated so it kind of makes me wonder if he's saying i saw nothing because he can't admit he knew it was gonna happen so he saw nothing i don't know i didn't see anything wasn't me i know nothing i see nothing i hear nothing i think at this point we have a lot of discussion about what londo saw what londo didn't see what the vorlons are but with the past two episodes and i haven't actually heard your all's discussion on the last episode yet because i haven't edited it yet so Whatever you talked about there. We but, apologize in advance. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I was high on cold medicine. I don't know what the other people's excuse is. Was it our oh. best work? Oh, well, <laughs> we'll see what our, our we'll see what our numbers are for this episode. We'll see. But um with the past two episodes, we've learned a lot about the Vorlons. Obviously, what they look like. But in the last episode, you found out that they've been jacking around with species, especially humans, for mm-hmm. at least 400 years. So I think at this point, it's safe to read what JMS said on the Usenets, where he basically lays out what the Vorlons are, because none of this is spoilers. This is all stuff you've seen, but that way everyone's on the same page. So I'm going to read it verbatim from the Usenet, and he goes, and I quote, Since the fall of night has now aired in the UK, and word is getting out, here with a post I left on Genie about Kosh's now revealed identity, I thought it came out fairly well, so I'm repeating it here. And he goes, okay, here it is. I'm going to do it. I'm going to reveal Kosh. I'm not kidding. Bail now if you're looking in and don't want to know. No backsies. I mean it. Last chance. Okay, this is it. If he leaves his encounter suit, he will be recognized. By who? Question mark. Everyone. The first ones taught the younger races, explored beyond the rim, built civilizations. Kosh is what you're pointing to when you say that's Kosh. Yes, the Vorlons have been to Earth. The Vorlons have been everywhere. The Vorlons are. They are. For centuries, the Vorlons have helped the younger races, guiding us and manipulating us. 
It is, as you say, a matter of perspective. They are a matter of perspective. Each race who sees them sees something out of their own past, their own legends, religions, faiths, a being of light, if you will. But Adrazi sees the Drazi version of that, Droshala. The Membari see the Membari version of that. Valeria, humans see a human version of that. It is the mirror in which we see our beliefs reflected. It is the progenitor of those beliefs or an implanted image that overlays that vision on top of the true form of the Vorlon. Is it a revelation or is it manipulation? The Vorlons are a cipher. The Vorlons are a matter of perspective. The Vorlons are guides, our users, emissaries or puppeteers who wish to be a certain way so that we will react properly. Is this good or is this bad? And the truth is, even though you have seen a Vorlon, have you seen the Vorlon, the one behind the image that d dances somewhere between your optic nerve and your brain? Or to quote a message I left a long ago, paraphrased from memory, the hand Sinclair sees, Emily, the hand Sinclair sees is not the hand Sinclair sees. The hand Sinclair sees is not the same hand someone else in the room sees. And it is not even the hand that the person sees the Vorlons are okay. That's JMS's answer for as cryptic as that is. Okay, Justin, let's talk a little bit more about Nazis. Yeah, um, and I 100% agree. Um, I don't remember who said it um, a couple comments ago, uh, but I 100% believe that Lentz was sent there. The whole investigation was just a sham. Lentz was sent there to negotiate a treaty a non-aggression pact with the, with the Centauri. And how many times in history have we seen that gone well? So that's, and it, you can definitely then, especially during Ivanova's um, kind of, you know, speech at the end, uh, where she's kind of breaking things down, you know, they immediately, as soon as that's done, what happens? The Centauri go out and they start taking more territory. When, he, you know, when Linda looked Sheridan in the eye and said, we're just, you know, we just want peace too. And then they immediately go back to war and start re-expanding re their empire because they know Earth is just going to look the other way or maybe even help them in some circumstances. So that's why I say shame on you, Earth, though. But um, the the part that kind of uh, intrigues me a little bit more out of this whole segment of this episode is the watching the evolution of what the Night Watch is becoming. Um, you see... At the very beginning, really nobody knew what it was. You know, Zach is like, oh, hey, you know, I'm going to get, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll let them pay me some extra credits just to wear this armband and stand around. And then you really start to see, especially during that scene where Zach gets publicly dressed down for not reporting as much right there in front of everybody and how detailed they want everything. And you're seeing Zach really start to see this for what it is and you know, and it's, you know, you have to report on everybody. Hell, even Sheridan, one of them, even Sheridan's C CIC staff reported on, them, you know, and that's, I'm curious about the ramifications from that going forward. If Sheridan can't even trust his own CIC staff, it's turning into a really scary situation. And especially during that scene towards the end where that poor shopkeeper ends up getting dragged, you know, out of his shop and, hanging a sign saying closed, you know, closed it, you know, cl closing down the business. And, you know, how much more are we going to see of that going forward? And it's, it's just, you know, it's something that a lot of us have been saying, I know I've been kind of blow, you know, on a soapbox about it during a few episodes. And I know other, others of us have been as well about exactly where we were just seeing earth going down a very dark path. And, it's it's getting scarier and scarier. Blake. So you've got Lance and Wells in Sheridan's office there at that scene, right? And Lance is all pissed off because Sheridan endangered this treaty that he's been working on with the Centauri. And Sheridan does that whole bit about I was following orders. It's right or not orders. It's regulations. I was within the law. And Wells backs him up on that. So you kind of see there where the dynamic is. Wells is clearly the one with the power and the authority in the situation. So it's kind of, you know, Justin can talk about this some too with the World War II and Nazi comparisons is there were those that were, you know, the dyed in the wool Nazis that were running things like the Gestapo, the SS. But then you have the other ones that were the people that believed the vision and were trying to do various other pieces. And I think that's the dynamic you're starting to see here. There's that split where you've still got the government bureaucrats trying to do the bureaucrat thing, but you're seeing more and more of the power going to this Night Watch group and other things directly loyal to Clark. So I just thought that was an interesting dynamic with this one. Nicole. 
Well, and I thought that that Wells guy was super manipulative and condescending the way that he talked to people. Like when he talked to Ivanova in her um, quarters and at the end of it, I just thought he was really like um, he was just the way he was. He he was like patronizing her like he was just really um, talking down to her and like being really manipulative. And the same with Zach in front of everybody. I wrote that down like that. He just, you know, I feel like he was like trying to berate him and cut him down. And then when he heard what he wanted, he's basically like, good boy, you know, like he he's just a condescending fuck face. Like I just he's awful. And he's the and I think, Blake, you're right. Like he kind of is the one who's kind of more in power here because he's leading the Night Watch and he's leading this group that basically is giving intel and like basically a bunch of tattletales. And, you know, when that girl approached him and basically blew the you know, spilled the beans or whatever. I was pissed because like, that's one that's like breaking trust of your commanding officers. But also like, I feel like there's going to be, I think, and maybe this is too much of a prediction, but like, it just showed that there's kind of like a break in like the people who are night watching the people that aren't. And I think that's going to be a super big conflict. And I think Zach is starting to see the writing on the walls that the night watch is bullshit. And I think that he is kind of like, what did I get myself into? And I think he will probably maybe quit or whatever, but like, they just were just his demeanor and the way he addressed people, the way he talked to people, the way he acted, he is not a good person. And I think that that's going to be nothing but problems going forward. And I think we've seen that to Nicole's point time and time again, with when groups get labeled into that other category and you start looking at who's loyal and who's not, I mean, think about just even a more contemporary reference than the Nazis. Think post 9-11 when they had all of the, if you see something, say something signs up in New York and the number of people they had calling in complaints about people who were Muslim that they had known for years, but all of a sudden they're calling these complaints in on. Mm -hmm. Sedition has been used to quell speech that has nothing to do with advocating for rebellion for you know, hundreds of years. And it's disgusting every time it gets done because there is actually sedition that happens. We saw that a couple of years ago, but then there's speech that happens that is protected or should be that gets used. Well, oh, oh that's sedition. You can't say that. Well, are they trying to incite rebellion? Then it's fine. They can say what they want. It's called the freedom of speech. I'm glad you guys are also bringing up uh, Zach a lot. JMS pointed out after this episode that Jeff Conway is getting more to do because he's, as J uh, JMS pointed out, he's showing that he's a really good actor. And this scene with Zach being questioned is amazing. And again, it goes back to what you all have been talking about too. Just go ahead and confirm it. We already know just confirm it it's fine and all of the people staring at him around the room with the peer pressure and him trying to fight it off i love zach and i love jeff conway and as we kind of discussed already unfortunately this is the high point of his career he he had a lot of trouble in his life and this is a point in his life where he's coming out of that trouble and unfortunately he's going to go back into it and lose his life to it. But we get to see an amazing actor right here. And I love it. Justin, what you got? Just touching real quick on a couple things, the way that Wells said everything to Zach too, like you had just stated, Scott was something that really hit me early on. Like the, the, you know, the caring father figure, instead of like insulting him, he's, he's insulting him, but doing it, making it sound like, well, we just, at the end of the day, we just really care about you, you know? And it's that same messaging we got from that Psycor commercial too. So you're starting to see a theme with how these people, people operate. And I think the most biggest difference that I noticed, um, and I could be way off, but between Lentz and Wells, I don't think Lentz is a true believer necessarily. I think he's doing a job. I think Wells, on one, on the, on the other hand, is 100% a true believer in what the Clark regime is is up to. Like he is 100% on board. You know, it's I know everybody out there hates the fact that we make Nazi references, but like I'm thinking, I look at Wells and I see Heinrich Himmler. Like in terms of just the the belief in what he's doing is right. Whereas I I think that I, I just don't seem like in Lent, the way Lentz was acting, I just don't, don't really see him as, as, as a true believer in the, in the, the Clark regime, but I could be wrong. You know, 
Justin, you say people get annoyed when we start talking about Nazis, but I, I it has to be said because this is a direct allegory to that. And I 100% agree, yeah. but yeah. So and JMS, he, he intended it that way. Yeah. And mm-hmm. we, and I know the newbies haven't been able to watch his autobiography, watch, read his autobiography yet, but JMS's direct family connections to Nazis drives some of his worldview. And so I think that has to come out. He, he experienced things that not many people have, and he is trying to warn people that this is how this happens. This is what happens. Yes, it's happened tons of times. John Adams and the Alien and Sedition Acts, it happens a lot. But in this case, the big one that everyone knows and everyone saw because it was a defining point in the entire world was Germany and the Nazis. So I don't think there's a problem with bringing that up because I think that's what JM, to Kevin's point, JMS is directly making an observation here. Well, and it's not even tied strictly to the Nazis in World War II. I mean, one of the pieces uh, JMS commented back is, you know, if you if it's just a one to one corollary of World War II, JMS says it limits the story. It makes it predictable. There are pieces in this story that go back to echoes of Vietnam. There's World War II, Korea, even the Middle East. There's all these pieces from history and all these different conflicts and how these things go wrong. Uh, that JMS has put into this show. And I think that's part of why it was so relevant then, but also why we're able to watch it 30 years later and draw these comparisons because this shit's still happening and we're still seeing it. So it's not just tied to one specific incident in history, even with JMS's personal connections to it. It hits on all these various pieces and you can pull all of these allegories and all of these correlations out of it. Emily, what do you got? Two points. One to what Justin was saying about Lance not being a hundred percent believer when he was trying to confront Sheridan. I think it was at that point. I mean, he was upset because he was more worried about his personal legacy and like this treaty is like my legacy. And it seemed a lot more tied to his ego and something he could be like, look what I accomplished, whether or not he fully agrees to the level of night watch. So I can definitely see where Justin's coming from on that. But the other one is the um, woman working in command. I was looking for an armband and either she was wearing it and it was blending into her costume or she wasn't wearing it. And they have people on Night Watch or some level of Night Watch who are not wearing the armbands so they don't know which would make sense because how are you going to tattle on Sheridan if she's running around in the office wearing the armband so he knows it's her yeah no you're completely correct there are people on b5 that aren't wearing the armbands andrew yeah going back to uh tying uh, this into the real world one thing that one connection that i've been making with night watch is uh McCarthyism uh, during the uh, what would that have been the Cold War? Okay, I'm seeing nods of, of agreement. So yeah, the Cold War. Um, like uh, like end of this episode, uh, uh, found out about the the shopkeeper, and so in response, they in a in a way blacklisted him. They just shut down his shop. I'm not quite there yet where I would be able to comfortably draw direct parallels to Nazism, but yeah, that's just kind of where I'm at right now with with the show, Justin. One last thing I want to mention about Wells, and I just want to talk about his shady recruitment tactics on Ivanova, because that was a very interesting scene in and of itself, where um, he even comes to her knowing that she's Sheridan's right-hand man. I think Wells is, uh, Wells, I think, definitely wants to nail Sheridan to a wall. And I think part of his tactic was to try and recruit Ivanova by saying, hey, you know, if you, if you kind of help me out and spy on your own station... I can get you that I can get you that Star Starship Command a lot sooner, you know, and just the way he's, you know, if he's go, if he's approached her, I'm sure there's others that that he's approached. We we may be shocked by find out if he, who who may exactly be working for him down the line. So it's just that's really definitely skeezy, skeezy dude doing skeezy things. So and I love the way that Ivanova just shut him down too, being like, nope, fuck you, don't need you. I'll get my own starship on my own terms. Thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Bye. Do you have a theory as to why Wells would want Sheridan nailed to a wall prior to the events of the, the Narn situation? I I don't. 
I just think that I don't know. I don't have any specific theory, but it just seems like he's he's putting pieces into place that to me just 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 makes me think that I don't know I get this vibe that he doesn't trust Sheridan. I just think that he wants to keep an eye on him at all times, even by threatening to remove him and put somebody in place that's more friendly to what they want to do. Um, to me, that says that he already, I think, questions Sheridan's loyalty to some degree. Interesting. Nicole, what do you got? I actually was thinking about that, too, because um, he basically threatens Sheridan, saying that if you don't apologize, we're going to get somebody else to run B5 that's a little bit more agreeable. And I think that either, well, first of all, I 100% think he wants Sheridan out of B5. Because Sheridan is a good, upstanding, loyal dude. I don't know if he necessarily wants it himself. Because, Kevin, you were asking about a theory. I think either Wells, I don't know if Wells wants it, but they definitely have a puppet they want to put in there that they can control. And I think they're trying to do what they can to oust Sheridan. That's kind of what I took from it. I think that they want to do everything they can to try to um, have Sheridan, like you said, nailed to the wall and just kind of out of the picture so they can have a sympathizer or like a somebody who they can uh, control in that spot because Sheridan is not about to let that happen. And clearly Ivanova isn't either. And I like that she gave him the business when he asked her. Like, so I want to go back to what Andrew said with uh, the McCarthyism piece, because JMS actually called that out on the Usenets too. Uh, he mentioned that there's absolutely a piece of McCarthyism within Nightwatch, looking at who is enemies of the people and, looking for spies in your midst type stuff. Because again, one of the things JMS commented of is you can't just draw that parallel back to World War II and to say uh, that it's just the Nazis or just the Gestapo. Um, because his comment was that it allows for the safety of saying, well, it happened just there and only once. We could never fall for that. And that's clearly not the case. So that's why he connects all these different pieces. It's not just the World War II piece. I mean, obviously Justin's picking up on that. Others have commented on the World War II connections, but no, Andrew's spot on with picking up that McCarthyism piece because it is these multiple pieces uh, that JMS is drawing upon as he puts this together. Andrew. Yeah, so uh, going back to the the question about theories uh, on what what's going on with uh, trying to get Sheridan off of B5, I think that Earth Alliance actually does, uh, or at least the government, whatever, they do think that or know that about this coup that's going on on Babylon 5. So they're trying to maybe at first discreetly get Sheridan off the po off of his post, but then they're seeing that that's not working. So now they try to basically bomb the the train that they, that he was on, on his way to signing the treaty. Mike. So two things, um, as far as the, the reference to McCarthyism, I definitely see it too. And was thinking the same thing. I kind of have to ask the question of, you know, what's, what's spookier. The fact that one day the shopkeeper, the, the shopkeeper next to you shop is just closed and he's vanished without a trace or the fact that they hung up a sign and said, you know, whether this person is guilty or innocent, they've essentially hung up a, a banner. Uh, they've 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 scrawled the uh, the message, the, the 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 red letter on his door that says, like, you know, he's being investigated by the Night Watch. You know, like that that was really interesting. It's like that to me is the most. Uh, the most telling or the most direct reference to the McCarthyism thing. It's like, well, we're not going to bother going to the extent of proving that this person is a commie or whatever. We're just going to go ahead and, you know, lay, lay the Tucker Carlson hint that, oh, uh, this person is probably a commie. We're going to just put it up there for everybody for the world to see and remove them so they can't defend themselves or, you know. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a, an interesting question. And then... I guess as far as Sheridan and, and, and Nightwatch go, I guess I kind of have a different read on that situation because to me, I have to ask the question of, you know, now that there's a whole new presidential re regime illegally installed in, in Earth Dome, what, what is keeping anybody from getting Sheridan off of B5 if they wanted him off of B5? Couldn't the president just snap his fingers and say you're recalled to earth and and i guess my my backing point to that is i actually think wells 
he either says the quiet part out loud by accident, but I don't think that guy does anything by accident. I think he does it all very purposely. And he basically spells it out and uses it as a threat to keep Sheridan where he is. I actually think they want Sheridan on B5 out of the way where they know where he's at and can watch him and maybe believe that they can minimize the damage that he can do to Earth. Because he he basically spells out, look, if you don't play ball, we're going to take you away. And this, and I'm going to offer you the alternative that's going to happen. We're going to put somebody horrible in your place. That's what's going to happen if you don't play ball. So they bully him into to not only doing what they want him to do by going out and making a public apology, but they basically give him the ultimatum of this is what, what you have to do if you want to be where you want to be. And it's, it's interesting that he would spell that out to his opponent. That makes a lot of sense, too. Emily. So to Mike's point about keeping Sheridan, it puts a pretty face on the shit. It's someone that people generally trust, you know, possibly, or at least people on the station. There might be general. It's it's like the respectability coding because he is the stand up guy and people that know him would know that. So they can give the appearance that, well, as long as he's still on B5, the shit's not as bad as it is. It feels like a cover for how bad everything is underneath and to your other point about the sign on the shop yeah i i thought that was interesting that they put the sign on the shop and they're like oh yeah closed down because he's being investigated for sedition and even if the shop owner comes back he's already lost his business because no one's gonna trust him and it yeah and it also tells everyone who walks by that Nightwatch is now watching and reporting and people are being investigated. So it's going to create um, fear and distrust. And once you get the fear and distrust, it's a lot easier to start manipulating people. Mike? I want to bring up one other small point, and that is that, uh, you know, when when that uh, person in CNC gave up the juice on the Narn cruiser that Sheridan and the rest of the command staff was hiding. I literally leaned forward in my seat and went, that bitch. Yep, same. Like, it, it was <laughs> it's such a powerful moment of betrayal. But then I have to turn it on its head and say, you know who 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 did keep that secret? You know who's who's the ride or die that never lets anybody on the station down? Tech David Corwin. Yeah. Babylon 5's phone operator. The new hero we need in the hero. Man, wizard. he's, he's cool. now, he's, uh, he's no Lou. Maybe he is the new Lou. I don't know. Also, Monkey Man bartender got recruited to the Rangers. I'm calling it right now. <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna show up with the robe and he's gonna be ready to go. Anything else you all want to talk about with this uh, episode? What about what's the deal with the? Um, what's the deal with? Oh, sorry. Oh my God, I hate you. The squadron because Keffer tried to talk to that guy, like trying to get information, and the dude just thought he was fucking with him. I think what? we should probably discuss Keffer in general at this point. I was point. waiting for it. That's why I was just yeah. waiting for it. Yeah, because he fucked around and found out and may have fucked everyone else in the process. Okay, let me let me let me start off this Keffer conversation with a couple points. First and foremost, JMS was asked, Is Keffer dead? JMS responded, he is an ex Keffer. Then his he was asked again. Melted. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you watched his face just turn into a skull and like right. well, and well, people then ask again, does that mean he's dead? And the response was dead as the proverbial doorknob. And we'll start the conversation there. Kevin, you want to start? JMS really didn't particularly want to have this guy on the show. Uh, he was a studio note. He was placed in there because they wanted some hot shot fighter pilot to be in the show. And JMS didn't really want to write for him and didn't really want to do much for him. And the first chance he got to kill him off, he did. Studios, when they when they screw around with a vision of, of somebody like JMS who has a clear vision for a show, they're not going to take well to it. And you might as well just kind of lean back and let them let them do their thing because some showrunners they they don't know what they want. Um, I could name a couple, but I don't want to be controversial. <laughs> but um, Damon Lindelof, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> as far as Jim, like, just leave the poor guy alone. But they they just wouldn't do that. They're like, hey, you got you need another character because the one thing this show clearly needs is more characters, and uh, wanted some hotshot fire pilot. And I think. 
I think it was coming on the heels of um, Top Gun. I think that's part of it too, wasn't it? Top Gun was in like eighty six. Hey, let's have let's have some Top Gun hotshot fighter pilot on yeah. the show, and you know some eye candy for the ladies, and see if it goes anywhere. They were really thinking about Iron Eagle, which is a better okay fighter or, pilot. I mean, it was kind of a different genre, but I'd say Jag kind of tapped into that too, and it was definitely yeah, going true. on at the same time because we lost Talia to it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. That's true. Like, I know you had more you wanted to add on this. Yeah, please. I mean, basically, that's just kind of where I was going to go, too. So Keffer was the studio note. And we've caught several of you who have commented before about the writing for Keffer and why he just sort of seems thrown in or, oh, damn, we need a fighter pilot. There he is. I do love that some of you have referenced him as Space Jesus, though, as we've gone through this. Definitely died for our sins. <laughs> <laughs> well, he died for somebody's sins, but I think it might have been the studio execs more so than ours. Him and the teddy bear both get ejected out the airlock. Yeah, if you notice <laughs> J- what JMS thinks of things that are cute in studio notes, they end up out in airlock. So at some point, somewhere, they end up out the airlock. I mean, we've been talking about this beyond the rim all season. That you guys are like, oh, what's Keffer going to do? Die. The whole point here is, as these guys have already said, JMS flat out did not like the note. He did not want to do it. He has a plan for all these characters. He has plans for other characters. He did not want to deal with Keffer. And so he decided right off the bat, okay, fine. I need a sacrificial lamb in this season and Keffer's going to be it. So here we are. And well, I think you can see that too, because this is the same season where we really start to get Zach Allen yep. becoming yeah. more and more through the season. You can tell the difference in the writing of who JMS wanted to write for and the stories that Zach Allen's getting versus what they ever used Keffer for. Exactly. And the last thing, too, on the notes piece is I can't remember the reference, but I know I've read somewhere JMS said by season three, the studio stopped giving notes, partly because the studio was almost going under at this point. PTN uh, was not doing well. And season three and season four, it's it's amazing that they even got it to air. And we'll talk about season five when we get to season five. So the studio didn't care anymore. So. By the time we get to next week's episode, the studio is not interfering anymore. And so JMS gets to run wild. But even when the studio did interfere, uh, he just doesn't give a shit. This actually, uh, I'm not going to go into too many details because I'm not sure how we're going to deal with a certain spinoff series yet. But this is why a certain spinoff series got canceled is because JMS said, fuck it. I'm not dealing with studio notes. And he was done. And we'll get to that. If and when we get to that. Well, and how many episodes was he really in for this season? You know, Keffer was oh, you know, five or six. Was their minimum contractual. Yeah. 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 And so I think very probably- little to do in those episodes he was even in. I mean, there was just hardly any Keffer going on. He's just barely in the in the credits just because, you know, the studio wanted him there. But his credits time might actually be more than his screen time. <laughs> he still has more time than the Toth who is in the opening credits. Set. True. We've already discussed why that actress left. Both actors left on that one. Justin, what do you got? The behind the scenes stuff makes a lot of things with Kepper make a whole lot of damn sense now. The one thing that I kind of picked up with this whole Kepper line is we know he's been, I mean, God, Sheridan had to order him to stop investigating um, the, the, the creepy spider murder ships. But now that he actually got one and he got the data out, I'm not sure if it was ever said who recovered it, but the fact it got leaked on the media and now the whole world knows that these damn things exist, that's something that's kind of sticking in my crawl about what kind of effect is that going to have. Remember, Dylan was adamant. The shadows cannot know what we know because Mm -hmm. they are not prepared and we are not prepared. And if the shadows know that we know they have returned, we are in trouble. I, yep. love the end of the, I love the I love the the last little lines there of this episode. Well, at least uh, we can keep that quiet. Oops, oops. Andrew. Yeah. So I was gonna talk about so like yeah, obvi- as Justin said, the behind the scenes stuff with Kaffer, it all makes sense. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that like like to me like because obviously I don't know anything about this like all the behind the scenes stuff or what's coming whatever. But like if Kaffer were to die in the show, uh, uh to me it it didn't feel earned because like a liberal estimate of maybe 10 at 10 minutes total of screen time uh like yeah it, it just it didn't feel that earned jms didn't uh, give a shit yeah 
that's what well, yeah, and like I, and like Shane i said it, it, did it, not give a shit yeah and, and it makes sense like because i i've had my share of studio notes uh quote unquote uh and having to uh put shit in that i really didn't want to have to just to make, help and make more sense or whatever or to satisfy whoever but my whole point is the Keffer's death didn't really have the the impact that it probably could have I looked it up, by the way. Keffer was in one, two, three, four, five, six episodes. Points of Departure, A Distant Star, Gropos, where he got most of his action. There, are, there, are all the honor lies, Confessions and Lamentations, and now this episode. So he was in six. Talia left after doing eight episodes because she was pissed she didn't have enough to do. So I will say, too, you know, we're beating up on Keffer a lot. I, I want to say I had absolutely no problem with the acting of Robert Russler, who played Keffer. I think he did a fine job with what he had. He just didn't have anything to do. And it's kind of a shit deal that he's like, oh, I'm a lead actor in a primetime show, but the showrunner's going to kill me because he doesn't want me here. It's great. It's great. Nicole, what do you got? Yeah, he did kind of get the shit under the stick. <laughs> and I think what Andrew said, that his death could have been a lot more impactful. But what I was thinking about the whole Keffer situation, again, I said I feel bad because I talked a little shit about him the whole season. But the intent on finding the creepy spider murder ships because he said he had to prove and he had to get the information. I feel kind of like, I mean, he probably knew that he wasn't going to make it out or he, I don't know, maybe it was cocky and thought he would, but him going and doing that and getting that information out kind of fucked everybody else. So I, it, I almost think is a little selfish. You know what I mean? If he would have done what he was going to do and get the information and maybe like give it to Sheridan or like one person, that's one thing. But the fact that like it was on the news and Delenn specifically said they can't know we know. Well, now the whole fucking world knows. So I think that's going to and maybe this is a prediction, but I think that's going to bring up the timetable on the war with them, you know, so I, I feel like, you know, his personal conquest was a little bit selfish and I think he wasn't thinking with his head um obviously you know he had to play the part he was given but like i just thought it was kind of like all right we get that you want to know what they are but like you have to understand your your consequences if you do that and i don't think he realized that he was actually going to die and then i also don't think he realized what would happen if he got that information out to everybody so i thought it was a little bit selfish well i mean the generic hotshot fighter pilot never thinks they're going to die true they're immortal. That's why right. they have fighter pilots. So I'm sure his whole goal was just to prove himself right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I disagree. I, I, I think based on the way that he and the other pilots talked about seeing the ships before the shadows before, I, I think he was pretty well aware that if he went on his mission, that he was not going to come back from it. But I think, you know, keep in mind, Keffer's not, in the inner circle he doesn't know what the bigger picture is what he knows is there's some scary ass shit flying around in space and he thinks he needs to warn people about it because it's bad so i think you know in, in, in his way i honestly think keffer kind of went out a hero in this you know whether whether it ends up screwing the rest of the universe by accident or not is a whole different story because it definitely does i i think he he went in it with the best intentions and i was gonna say i mean uh, you hit the nail on the head i think robert wrestler did a, a good job with the character and everything i liked actually the the keffer that we saw in gropos and i think i connected with his character the most in this episode i think in a different show with a different kind of focus and ensemble cast his whole storyline about trying to avenge his buddy's death and warn the universe about an impending doom is a pretty good uh, and pretty interesting plot line. But, uh, you know, in, in this show and with how little screen time and focus it got, yeah, it was kind of, you guys said it, you got the shit under the stick. Wouldn't it be funny though? Cause I still think the, the reboot's going to happen and we'll talk about that another day, but wouldn't it be funny if JMS went out of his way in the reboot to make a hot shot fighter pilot and actually like make it his own. So people are like the whole time, oh, that fucker's gonna die. That guy's gonna die. It turns out like he's the savior of the entire show. That would be such a bullshit maneuver by JMS. And I think JMS is the crotchety guy to do it. And they <laughs> so. name him Le Lieutenant Pfeffer or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, just keep him Keffer. Lieutenant <laughs> Keffner becomes like the, the savior of the universe by the end. Just a point. Like I can write for these people when I want to. Nicole, what do you got? I was just going to add to what Mike said, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I want to point out that Nicole's giving Londo more credit than Keffer. 
Like she's like she's seriously right now. No, so you are blaming Keffer bit, yeah. for the Great War, but Londo's got a spark of hope. <laughs> I'm not blaming Keffer for the war. I'm just saying he escalated the timetable, and I didn't say Londo is good. I said he might have a spark of somewhat of guilt in there, but he is never going to act on it. I just like giving you shit. I know, I know, but I don't want people thinking I'm a dickhead, so I had to correct you. Uh, that's my job, Kevin. What do you got? That's why that that scene with Garibaldi and Sheridan talking about Londo is uh, kind of under the radar really good because mm -hmm. it nails exactly what's going on with Londo. Be like no one else on the station really can other than Veer, who wouldn't wouldn't go into that kind of detail with anybody out of loyalty. But Garibaldi's got him nailed pretty down to the T. That's why that that scene is really cool to me. The other thing I wanted to mention really quickly is I mentioned Roy Dotrice and and John Vickery, but I also want to mention the gentleman that played the the Narn war leader, Robin Sachs. He's got a lot of credits on his name too. And I, I thought uh, he didn't get enough to do. He's a really good character actor, but there's some other stuff out there, including some Star Trek stuff that he's really good in. Uh, you know, and quite frankly, the other, the other uh, Star Fury pilot, uh, Harvey, that uh, interacted with Keffer, you know, for being somebody who doesn't have a ton of credits to his name, I thought he was a better actor than a lot of the guest stars <laughs> that they had throughout season one. He, he did a good job of playing the uh, haunted guy who's seen some shit. I want to know why Kosh looked the way that he did to Sheridan. JMS, Would he look different to different humans? JMS answered that question, and he said that it is a reflection of the person's views. And he flat out said, because he was asked, would a Buddhist see Buddha? And the answer is yes. The Vorlons would show themselves based on the person's higher power thoughts. So Sheridan is a Christian of some sort, so he saw an angel. Uh, well, a Christianized angel. I was going to say, uh, that's sure not how I would picture an angel. but Well, we can get into that conversation later. Accurate angels, man. Anything else you guys want to talk about before we go into questions and predictions? Was the Centauri who planted the bomb, have we seen him before? He looked familiar. Has he been a Centauri in another episode? I think so. They yeah. usually have about four or five major actors that, well, not major, but, you know, the, the guest actors who can, they move around a lot because this is a low budget show. So you see a lot of people moving around this a lot. It's probably a gaffer on set. Yeah, it's probably the caterer. They just stuck the, <laughs> yeah, the Centauri stuck there wood on, on him. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> By the way, again, you know, I, I, a couple of episodes ago, I bitched how Roku, whoever the intern was who picked where the ad breaks are, was really, really freaking stupid. Well, Roku, the ad break starts right when that Centauri gets up and walks out of the train, and it goes to ad. And then the ads come back, and Sheridan looks at the Centauri as he leaves. I'm just like, why would you put an ad right there? Uh, what the f <laughs> roku, roku. <sighs> okay well let's go ahead and go into questions and predictions and for those of you who are joining us for the first time our newbies again have not watched past season two and so they're going to give us any lingering questions that they have after watching this episode and watching the whole season and then they will also give us their predictions of what they think is going to happen next which guys we are now two out of five seasons done with this show we are almost to the midway point of this show in a few months we'll be halfway there living on a prayer okay let's go to nicole first questions and predictions well i had a lot of questions about um the vorlon but you answered those so i won't ask those again but i yeah. thought that was really cool um my, you literally answered all my questions. So yay, I didn't have to wait for Beyond the Rim for 5,000 years. So a couple of questions I had was, is there going to be any sort of penalty for the Centauri that tried to assassinate Sheridan or any penalties for the Centauri in general? Um, because clearly it was the Centauri that did it. And obviously there was someone who told him to do that. So is there going to be any sort of repercussions for that? Which I'm thinking no, but I had to ask. And then do the actual shadows know that they've been got, like that they've been found out? Do they figure out that like the world has seen them now? Um, so those are my questions. And then as far as predictions, Lando's going to continue to spiral down 
the negative spiral. Um, Zach is going to get out of the night watch or double cross the night watch and report to Sheridan on that. I think he's going to, he's going to, he sees through the bullshit or he's starting to, and I think he's going to break away from that. I think Wells is going to continue to cause issues with the night watch and the whole dynamic. I think he's going to come back. I could be wrong, but I feel like if the night watch is going to be around and he's in charge of it, we might see him again. I think that if the shadows do know that they've been found out, I think the Centauri are going to be the least of their problems. And I think that that's going to just completely go under the rug because they're going to have a bigger and more evil force to deal with than the Centauri. Andrew, questions, predictions? Two predictions. First prediction is that Earth Alliance knows about the coup uh, and is now trying to get uh, Sheridan off the station. And then the other one... Uh, I need to provide a little context here so that I forgot to mention during the discussion, but uh, there's a, the scene where uh, Sheridan is like questioning his position with Earth Alliance and he even says that his uniform doesn't even feel like uniform uh, anymore. It just kind of feels like like just another piece of clothing. And Ivanova tells him, well, maybe 20, 2260 is the year we define it again. Uh, so uh, my other prediction is that sometime in the next season, so season three, Sheridan will uh, somehow uh, take control of Earth Alliance and kind of bring it full circle with to Ivanova's line about redefining it. And as for questions, uh, just one, is this the last time we'll see Kasha's true form? Or specifically, will we see him as like other forms? Great. Emily, questions, predictions? So, predictions. We'll start there because there's a lot of questions. I predict Zach will leave Nightwatch. He seems like he's figured out what it's all about and he's not on board. I think Sheridan, Ivanova, and Garibaldi might actually leave Earth Force to fight the Shadows because Earth is... I don't, I don't know what they're doing, but they're being dumbasses. The war with the Shadows will start earlier than they wanted it to because thanks, Kefir. I think the Shadows are fully well aware of what he was doing out there. And the Centauri Narn conflict is going to make it easier for the Shadows to attack the other worlds because they're going to be too distracted by trying to deal with the Centauri and their bullshit. So now to questions. So many questions. Why the hell is Earth siding with the Centauri? <laughs> like, why? I need to know the why behind this because it seems like a bad choice. Is Morden working with someone on Earth and trying to manipulate the situation so they're like doing this agreement with the Centauri, what what is the reasoning behind all this? Um, so since we know the Vorlon are basically the inspiration for angels of sorts, does that mean the shadows are the inspiration behind demons? Is that where we get like the light and the dark, the angels, the demons, and many of the religions? Um, is Londo losing trust in Veer when Veer and Lanier have their conversation um, Veer's implying that him and Londo aren't as tight as they used to be, and Veer's told Londo straight up he doesn't like what he's doing before, so Veer might not be quite inner circle level like he used to be. Um, what do the Vorlon actually look like? Not what we think they look like, what do they look like? Are they just like bright little orbs of light and energy? What, what are they? Um, and we are, that one got answered, so we can skip that one. Because not all Night Watch wear armbands, apparently. Um, why did Wells tell Ivanova he would keep a space for her? Because she rejected him and he's like, that's okay. I'll keep that spot open for you. Like he's knows something and might try to manipulate her. <laughs> Does B4 come back? Like, do we have another Babylon station? And that's where Garibaldi and Ivanova and Sheridan go to fight the shadows. Um, I still want an explanation for why the shadows seem hellbent on basically exterminating everybody. And did Londo know about the assassination attempt? Is that why he said he saw nothing? And that's it. I always prepare myself when Emily has to go because I'm say, okay, here we go. I'm gonna be typing a lot. Justin, questions, predictions? I have the same one as Emily. What do the Vorlons really look like? And will we ever get that answered? instead of just appearing as like gods or angels to each particular person who sees them. Who leaked the footage of the, the creepy murder ships? And will that cause a panic 
over the revelations that these shadows exist? And then how does Sheridan respond to the fact that he he can't even rely on his own command staff? So will he tighten people out? Will he close the circle? Kind of how does how does that how does he kind of respond to that situation? One that we might be able that 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 you might be able to answer for me, just because it's something that I don't remember. Doesn't JMS have some kind of religious background? Um, because and I was wondering be, because like the I've seen different like representations of different angels before, and the way Kosh appeared to Sheridan was very like Moroni like. So is there any reference to like did JMS have a background in Mormonism or does Sheridan have a background in Mormonism? So Justin, JMS talks in his autobiography a little bit about his uh, fleeting relationship with religion. Um, He did go to some private schools, but he got involved with a religious cult. And again, this is his words straight from his book. It is a religious commune cult type thing Mm -hmm. that he lived in where it was multiple people living in a house and there was like the monitor from the church who kept an eye on that whole mess. And may have touched some of the girls. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, he has a very jaded view of religion and basically has nothing to do with religion, uh, which is interesting because the religious elements he puts into the show, um, even thinking about just that closing scene, I know we're in the questions and predictions, but that closing scene uh, with Ivanova lighting the candles of the menorah as that goes through and you think about the overall theme of the episode and how much it plays into that, there's actually a whole thing out there about the symbolism of Ivanova and that scene to the the arc of this episode in season. Cool. Um, those are all of my questions. Predictions. I think Nightwatch was actually behind the assassination attempt. I could be wrong. I think Zach sticks with Nightwatch, but he, and I think Nicole said the same thing, but he becomes a spy. I think he's going to feed stuff about Nightwatch to Sheridan and maybe even be feeding Nightwatch some false intel. But I think Zach's going to, Zach, I think, is completely disillusioned by Nightwatch and will actually be kind of a spy for Babylon 5. Then this may be either, I guess you can chalk this up to either a question or a prediction, but I'm expecting some kind of cult of Kosh to rise up on the station with the people that saw him with the, and saw their own deities represented in Kosh. Does, does Kosh become some kind of religious figure on the station? And then... Um, you know, because we all know how non-aggression packs have gone in the past. I think Earth will eventually screw this Centauri over somehow. I'm not sure how, but I just kind of expect that they're just using the Centauri to get what they want. And then when they have it, they're going to just screw the Centauri over completely. So that's all I've got for today. Well, that will wrap up our time with the newbies for season two. When we come back next week with the newbies, it will actually be for our season two recap show, which... If you're catching this when it first airs, our recap show will be live Sunday, May 21st at 9 p.m. Central Time. It's already linked up on our YouTube, so you can click that little notify button on YouTube to catch the live show, which will have interaction from the audience as well, too. So if you really want to chat with us about all things Season 2, be sure to check that out next Sunday night at 9 p.m. And then we will release that live show as an audio format to the podcast, as we always do on the next Wednesday. So two weeks from today, we will release the first episode of season three. And newbies, I have told you when we get into this every time what the name of each season is. So season one was Signs and Portents. Season two was The Coming of Shadows. You are now going to begin the point of no return. Dun, dun, dun. dun. (laughs) So we will see you all here next week for our live season two recap. And then after that with season three. And for those of you who are okay with not being spoiled, stick around after the credits and we will answer all these questions and predictions from our newbies. So until we do all of that, be sure to like, subscribe, follow, click the notify button, click all the buttons. And be sure also to join our conversations on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and our Patreon Discord if you can as well. And then finally, please, please, please keep leaving those reviews. We love reading them even when they're not nice. And also it does help get the show out to more people. So until next week, I am Scott and with me has been... Emily. Nicole. Blake. Andrew. Kevin. Justin. And Mike. You all in season three. 
Bye. Bye. Woo woo. Thank you for listening to Gray 17, a Babylon 5 podcast. You can find all the places to listen to and watch this podcast at anchor.fm slash gray 17 podcast or youtube.com at gray 17 podcast. We want to hear from you. So join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or Patreon. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review where you are listening to or watching this podcast. Gray 17 is not affiliated with, and the podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by Warner Brothers or any other owners of the Babylon 5 copyright. All clips included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. The opening and closing themes are available from Falling Matter on YouTube. And what's out there? The rim. And beyond that? The truth. Welcome back to the last Beyond the Rim of Season 2. And again, if you have not watched past Season 2, this is a spoiler section, so you should leave now. If not, we'll go ahead and dive right into the questions and predictions. Let's start talking about the Centauri and all of that first. So the first thing is a question about will the Centauri, as either the the, the gunman or the bomber or the Centauri in general, face any kind of punishment for the assassination attempt on Sheridan? It would just kind of gloss over it because always next time they're fixing it and just kind of moving on. Yeah, it's just a plot point, really. I mean, we don't really discuss it anymore. He's a lone bomber who, who knows why. Uh, I'm sure... The conspiracy theorists are like, oh, it was all part of a plan. And I know somebody mentioned that Londo was involved. But really, I think you see it actually when Sheridan's walking down the hallway. Those two guys just see an opportunity like, hey, this is an asshole who is causing problems. Let's just take him out. Yeah, you could easily understand that any Centauri on the station would be agitated. I mean, furious about the fact that B5 fired on and destroyed a Centauri cruiser. So. They're, they're eager, just they're just some guys that were for revenge is all I took that to mean. Mm-hmm. So speaking of asshole Centauri, why is Earth siding with the Centauri? Is Morden involved? Question mark. Well, I mean, we didn't we have did. it in for, oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was going to say, well, we know, we know Earth and the humans and Centauri have had a longstanding relationship um, where for a long time the Centauri kind of grafted themselves to and rode earth's coattails and i think now it's just kind of a flip of the script almost we're seeing the centauri rising to power and they still want to be buddies we have the closest probably relationship to them than we do you know obviously the narn are off the table and we're not gonna hop in bed with the minbari anytime soon because of the way the relations there have gone so it just kind of makes sense they're the two biggest hitters in the room that seem to have the most in common yeah and you're right on that too mike i mean it's it's called out a couple times and it'll be called out again in uh, in the beginning the movie that the centauri were the first race the earth uh you know earth encountered so they are our first experience with civilized races outside of our solar system and there's that whole scene with uh God, Lando and Garibaldi, I forgot the exact context of it, but they kind of talk about it briefly, mm-hmm. you know, how the Centauri yep. told Earth lots of different things and they <laughs> told they were a lost them. colony. Yes. Till they realized yeah. that we don't have six dicks. So <laughs> Well, and the other part, we'll see it a little bit later coming up in a few episodes. Earth's got the guy that comes to investigate Kefford's reporting and talk to the various races to identify the shadow ship. Well, at least appearing to investigate to try to figure out what that ship is and the very last or one of the very last scenes of the episode is they're back on earth and they're talking about you know no one really knows what it is it's confident and sitting in that room is morden so morden is in contact with earth so i don't think it's a stretch to think that maybe uh morden and some of them are pulling the strings through their psychor contacts and other contacts to get earth aligned with the centauri i think it was nicole i think who was spot on when in her predictions she said the centauri will serve as a distraction which helps the shadows that's exactly what's going on yep. this is how the shadows work they try to stir all a bunch of pots so it's easier to cull the weaker races and to make the stronger rise up so all of this is just the shadows meddling and that is the Centauri 
That is the other little stuff that's going on on the sides that we haven't even heard about yet. This the shadows are absolutely playing games in Psychor. They're playing games in Earth Dome. All of that is them just trying to get the races to cause conflict because they believe conflict causes evolution, and so that's what they want. So is Londo losing trust in Veer? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. I I love this episode as a Veer fan. This is, I jokingly call it, Abraham, Abraham O'Laconi begins because this is where Veer decides. And it's in those two scenes. It is not the linear Veer bar scene, although I love that scene too. You see uh, Veer on top of a scaffolding, on top of a little walkway, just looking down. And you can see his, his, his thoughts. He is definitely thinking. And then the other scene is, of course, the scene in the elevator with Jakar saying, I cannot forgive you. And that is when Veer decides he must do something. And we will find out later that Veer will become somebody who helps to create a way for people to get away from the, um, from, uh, the Centauri clutches. So Abraham Lincoln begins in this episode. Do the shadows know that they have been found out? I mean, by the end of this episode, probably. Do the shadows know that Keffer recorded them and so forth and so on? I mean, they know, but then I, we get again to that investigation episode. We get a few episodes into season three where they basically come back and say, oh, yeah, they don't know a damn thing. Yeah, I think a lot of it is arrogance, too. Yeah, Delin and Kosh and everybody are so scared about when the shadows find out what's going on. But the shadows also believe that they can't be stopped. They learned their lesson. They've looked, licked their wounds after B4 uh, stopped them a thousand years ago, which we have a question about that in a moment. But they're, they don't see that this is a problem. The, do we know they've returned to Zaha Doom yet? That's the big question. And of course, the shadows don't know that we know that. But yeah, I don't think it's a huge, a huge major issue. But you're right, uh, Blake, it's going to be a couple of different story points in season three. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's a huge factor one way or the other. Is this the last time we will see Kosh's true form? Well, that's not Kosh's true form. And uh, we will see a true form of a Vorlon, but it won't be Kosh. It'll be when we kill Kosh 2.0. We will see their real form, which is a tentacled, almost looks like a flying shadow. It's got like multiple tentacles and doesn't look very happy. <laughs> are the shadows demons since Vorlons are angels? I mean, within the mythology structure of the series, yeah. I don't think in the way, not necessarily in the context of which uh, they asked this question, but yeah. Yeah, but I think also too, I, I, I think there's a difference in what the shadows do and what the Vorlons do. The shadows don't imprint on lesser species and... Yeah turn them into uh, telepaths like the Vorlons do. So I don't think the shadows went back and, you know, to mess around with uh, earthlings back thousands of years ago and became our, you know, devil type icons. No, I, uh, I absolutely agree with you on that. I, I don't think they imprint either. That's why I said, I don't think it's the yeah, context yeah. with which the question was, but I think the Vorlons and their manipulation portrayed the shadows as That's a good point as the flip side so i mm -hmm. that's kind of where i was going with it whereas you know the vorlons can't make themselves the an angelic beings of light without the opposite side of that coin they had to have the other side there mm -hmm. and case in point if the shadows had done the same thing that people would see the shadows as angelic beings of light more than likely because mm -hmm. who on earth would go back and you know imprint on a species as we're the ultimate evil thing that you believe in i mean i guess well, i mean try to rule by fear that way but well i mean someone obviously touched rupert murdoch at some point <laughs> womp womp. you can send your hate mail to gray 17 podcast at gmail.com hey they Here. still listen to us though they still <laughs> fucking listen to us we know who you are you hate listeners because you keep <laughs> commenting hi <laughs> hi we know the vorlons make themselves of the angels the shadows are, you know, demons, at least in the Vorlon's eyes. And we also know that that's not the true form of the Vorlon, but we will see that. So the one of the predictions is, is the newbies believe, or at least one of them does, that Kosh will now become a religious figure. First off, he is already. He's ingrained into people's minds. But I think for some, Delin, he already is kind of a higher power. She looks at him as such. 
But to the point of what they were saying, yes, we will see that there'll be some interest from religious figures about the fact that an angel has popped up on the uh, the station, which leads to one of my favorite episodes. So I think that adds an interesting dynamic. You know, you mentioned that Delin already views Kosh as a religious figure. You know, we already know Delin has seen Kosh's true form before now. Sheridan has not. And there's that scene in this episode where Sheridan's kind of criticizing the Vorlons as not necessarily being perfect. And Delenn's a little bit taken back with that. And I wonder if that plays in that Delenn has seen Cautious Form and has seen this religious figure uh, prior to now. So I wonder if that's kind of where Delenn's got more of that reverence and deference to this religious figure, whereas Sheridan, having not seen that, is a little more willing to say, you know, screw these guys. They're, they're just fucking with shit. Yeah, and- yeah, Sheridan's response was kind of odd in that too, because in one in one second he's like really misty eyed about the whole thing, and then he kind of has a quick mood swing to like, how dare they? But then turns one eighty again, and he's like, well, he didn't save me, so <laughs> it was kind of interesting. I thought again, being probably the <laughs> the most doobie of the first ones, I'll ask the question or, or or say this: it wasn't immediately clear to me how many people in that crowd that witnessed the rescue realized that that was Kosh. My understanding is that almost none of them knew that that was Kosh. They all saw something, but they didn't see that it came out of an encounter suit. That is true. Yeah, because Kosh and Glenn were off to the side. Well, as far as yep. Kosh becoming a religious figure, I think everybody was assuming that every you know the whole station witnessed Kosh leave his suit and go rescue Sheridan, and I don't think that's what happened at all. You're right, Mike. Yeah, good point. This is what happens when I don't watch the show for five years and do a <laughs> show about it. <laughs> So let's get into the Night Watch, and I'm going to take a couple predictions, too, and kind of mingle them together because I think they all kind of fit. So the, the question is, how will Sheridan respond to not having full control of his staff? But then we also had some predictions, too, including Night Watch was behind the assassination attempt. Uh, Zach will either leave the Night Watch or double-cross them or become a spy, one of the three or some of the three. And then Wells will continue to cause problems for the station. Well, Sheridan, you know, tries to figure out you know, a a couple of key personnel, Corwin in in particular, whether, you know, they think he can be trusted. And they end up actually being wrong about Corwin. You know, um, Ivanova doesn't seem to think after having talked to him that he's going to, he's going to play ball and uh, uh, be loyal to, to Sheridan Ivanova, but he, in, in the end turns out absolutely, you know, is rock solid loyal to to sheridan and and ivanova he he surprises even himself it's a really cool moment it it is a good question for the newbies to ask because it is definitely a major theme of season three um and you know the the culmination of zach allen's story arc with this you know during the point of no return uh and severed dreams uh part is uh is a really cool one where he ends up uh, double crossing night watch and coming back into the fold of the the command staff uh it's it's a it's a very very cool part of that that story arc well, what's yeah, interesting that. with that story arc kevin is the you don't really see much of sheridan reacting mm-hmm. to the staff and who's loyal and who isn't gary garibaldi gets that storyline yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you get to see that scene where Garibaldi goes into the security office and just absolutely loses his shit over, you know, this is the team I built. Now it's who's wears an armband and who doesn't. So I, I really think, you know, the question's a great question, but it's Garibaldi who gets the storyline, not Sheridan. And it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And we'll find out that many of Garibaldi's security doesn't stick with him. And that's why we get some Narn security in there as well, too. The, with Corwin, I see Corwin, and I, I, Kevin, you're completely right, and I, I love that little storyline he gets. I see Corwin much like I see Lockley when she answers the question, whose side were you on? I was on the side of Earth. Corwin's the same way. Mm-hmm. He saw that Earth, the, the right side of Earth, was sticking with the station command and what they were doing, and that's what he went with. So he was a patriot. Just that's what he saw his patriotism doing. And then Emily, uh, as our last question is, I'm assuming still in the middle of her rewatch of season one. Now, <laughs> she has a, now she randomly has a Babylon squared question. So is B4 yeah. coming back? Evil Knievel couldn't make that fucking jump in this episode. <laughs> yeah. She's so perceptive 
but not in this particular case. I legit, I know for a fact because she's told me that she's actually rewatching season yeah. one right now. So I guarantee you what happened was she watched Babylon Squared like a week ago and she had to ask again. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> what happened. But yeah, so I mean, we're going to, we've, we've talked about before, before, ha ha ha. But we definitely are going to have that storyline in this season. Season three, we finally get War Without End, which is an amazing two-parter and guys we're gonna have to have an i think we've had this conversation if i remember right and i believe we said we were going to actually treat it as one episode we were going to watch war without end parts one and two together but we're yep. still going to have to make sure that's what we want to do when we get there because we are only uh it's, it's the second part of the season but we're, we're getting there we're getting there fast so yeah before we'll come back uh but not in the way she thinks because she's thinking before is going to become a staging area for this war and that's not the case. It helped stop the shadows the last time. Okay, let's move into predictions for our newbies. And we've answered a couple of them already, so we'll jump around. Earth will eventually screw over the Centauri. Not really. They don't get an opportunity to because they have to fight a civil war. Yeah. Right. I think, for as we've already discussed with the reasoning, that Earth is the, the Earth that we have now under President Clark is happy to deal with the centauri and side with the centauri because the centauri are going to stir some stuff up with the non-aligned worlds and keep the narn at bay and that means they have we we don't have to deal with these aliens we don't have to deal with them we can deal with our own stuff because the centauri is going to stir their own shit and as long as we have a non-aggression pack with the centauri we don't have to deal with that crap and i think that's what they're going with here there is going to be some shit with Sheridan and Delenn and the Centauri, but that is a whole different story. Yes. Yes. And the Earth Force is not going to like that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Along those same lines, the Centauri are no longer going to matter or be a big issue when the shadows come. Mm. See, again, it's it's interesting. We, we, we build up this whole shadow war and the Great War, but I always love going back to the scene where Marcus and Franklin are on Mars and no one knew it had actually happened. Like Marcus calls out, we won, we, we saved the galaxy and no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> so really the shadow war is never the hot war for everybody. It is these little pockets of stuff that happen. Um, well, so, I think some of that, sorry, I was going to say some of that, I think gets into this conflict we have with Sheridan and Kosh though, where Sheridan finally blows up and Kosh says, you've got to let me fight this my way. Yep. It never gets a chance this time to become the war that it was a thousand years ago. Correct. Yep, they stop it beforehand. You're right. Because Sheridan goes to Zaha Doom and nukes the shit. Londo will continue to spiral. Yes. yes. Oh, Although yeah. we're, we're going to get a good episode right now, that, uh, two weeks from now, where Londo really tries to break ties with Morden, and we see what happens when he does. And so Londo has, Londo has a long way on this dark path to keep walking before it's all said and done. By God, he has that spark of decency. Yeah, he does. I'm telling you, he's got a he's got a he's got a good heart when he drops asteroids on people. He's got a good heart. Well, okay, look, I gotta push back just slightly. Because <laughs> it's not him that drops the asteroids. No, no he just not. watched others do it. But, but he, he watched others do it and he did nothing to stop it. He was just following orders, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean I think it was it was it was interesting because you know in this episode Garibaldi gets his his brief moment on screen where he spells out his hot take on Londo and where he's at. And I think it's a hundred percent accurate. And I think it's also just a little bit different from what any of the newbies up till this point have have suggested, you know? Mm -hmm. It's that whole like, yeah, he's he's riding a bucking Bronco and he's he's <laughs> going to continue holding on whether it means it's getting worse or not he just doesn't want to get thrown off yeah because at the end of the day he has called out what he truly wants from the beginning and, and yeah. uh, mike you mentioned this scene he wants the centauri to rise back to power how it gets there is unfortunate and he's also talked about this in knives and how they get there is not the way he really would want to get there but he wants them to get there anyway so you're right. He's going to keep riding along. Moving over to the Earth Alliance. Earth Alliance knows about the coup, knows about Sheridan's Army of Light. Not yet. Soon. Soon. That's season three. Sheridan will continue this, uh, Andrew. Speaking <laughs> of stretches like B4, <laughs> Sheridan will take control of Earth Alliance in season three. If he hadn't said season three, he would almost be there. <laughs> but no, Sheridan's not going to take Earth Alliance over in season three. 
he will create a galactic uh, union in season five, but that's about it. Or season four, actually. But Sheridan will break away from Earth Alliance, which is what the next prediction is. Sheridan, Ivanova, and Garibaldi will leave Earth Force, among others. And, and they take the station with them. Yep. Yeah. And they're white stars, too. <laughs> we'll get to that later. But I think it's, I, I actually thought he was going to go a different way on the last question, by the way, when Andrew started saying, he started talking about Sheridan's uniform. And I know these guys have seen the action figures. So I thought for sure Andrew was going to say they're going to change uniforms in season three. I thought he was but, too, absolutely. But then he makes the jump to they're going to take over Earth Alliance. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's not where I thought that was going. Okay. <laughs> they took over Earth Alliance and brought new tailors. Yes. Okay. I, I do like those uniforms better for sure. The black ones? Yes. I'm partial to both for different reasons. Uh, but yeah, we can talk about those when they come. Yeah. So last two is with Space Jesus. The last time I think we'll ever speak of Space Jesus, I believe. <laughs> and that is Keffer's actions will start the war sooner and the shadows knew what Keffer was up to. Oh, uh, no. Not really. Neither. Neither yeah. of those. The, the, I mean, it, it allows for people to have knowledge of the shadows quicker than what Delenn wanted. But at the end of the day, I don't think it makes a huge impact or difference. And I don't think the shadows knew what Keffer was doing. I think the shadow vessel just detected that he was flying up their tailpipe and turned around and took him out. Yeah, That's which frankly, works. the way we've seen shadows behave around other ships before has been kind of interesting because it's almost, I mean, I feel like we've seen them basically do flybys and just... Mm -hmm where they would clearly know another ship was there and they just don't care. Mm -hmm. I think it's when another ship starts actively tailing them that they're like, okay, like we can't have I that. Made, I haven't made a Star Trek reference in a while. It's kind of like the Borg. If you leave the Borg alone, they're just going to let you go. But as soon as you start, you know, poking at them, they're going to shoot at you. So the one question I have for you guys before we wrap this up, and I'm going to ask this question of the newbies on our live season to recap which again mark your calendars may 21st will be live on youtube we have now had two seasons finales we have had chrysalis and we've had the fall of night i would love to hear from you guys real quick which one you think is the stronger season finale so far this one fall of night yes fall of night mm -hmm. i would actually yeah. go chrysalis Mike, well, we can talk about it in a second but mike what do you think <laughs> i'm gonna go with fall of night only because besides chris the <laughs> the uh chrysalis namesake i don't actually remember what happened in that episode it's the one where garibaldi gets shot okay i mean the scale of this one is much larger yeah i i'm kind of torn on it and it depends because you're right the scale i mean jms called it out that this is he believed at the time that this was one of the most um he didn't say use the, the term epic but one of the most epic visual effects shows that we've ever seen there's a whole bunch of composite work. There's a whole bunch of CGI. We have the big battle scene. Babylon 5 takes damage really for the first time. Uh, but I, I, I think Chrysalis does more to turn the tables and to change things up. And Blake, I see you're nodding, so I'll go to you and you can add to that if you want. Yeah, and, and I think that's exactly why I picked Chrysalis to this question is Chrysalis to me reset the board. And it moved things around to where you had the assassination of Santiago. You had Garibaldi getting shot to cover up the conspiracy uh, by his second in command. You had the change starting with Delenn. You know, Chrysalis to me sets everything else up going forward for the path that we're going to be on, kind of that transition point from story A to what we ended up with. This episode is massive in scale. Uh, the VFX shots alone, there were more VFX shots in this than there were in the gathering uh, in this one episode. So it's definitely a massive episode in terms of scale. I just think in terms of moving the story, this episode didn't really move anything around. We already have everything established, except for, you know, seeing the form of Kosh. That's like the one new piece that's introduced. Chrysalis changed the game. I'll say this much. If you watch this episode, I, I, it's funny. I, I kind of agree. And I'll say that there's this big scale. And where, where this episode leads you to believe it ends is that it leads you to believe with the the keffer footage <laughs> the keffer the keffer tape being leaked that uh the war is gonna just be in full force like start of season three and i think that's probably where a lot of the newbies are at right now now we all know and we've just discussed that that's not actually how it happens that it doesn't you know it doesn't actually accelerate the timeline at all but i think from a newbie perspective they probably think it does and kevin you went the other way so how do you why do you think fall of night is more impactful hearing mostly blake and you know the, the rest of the conversation 
it's a compelling case that you're making. Uh, I, I have trouble arguing with it too much, but I guess I was going from the perspective of, you know, which episode I enjoy more. I, I'm not, I'm not the guy that only likes the space battles, but I like a good space battle. This really shows you the level to which the Centauri are going to be pains in the ass throughout the rest of the series. Um, you didn't get, you didn't get the sense for, you know, too much what was going on in the world. Um, you in in Chrysalis, you got some idea for what was going on, you know, in Earth and with Delenn. But um, this has a more grand scale to it. And I think, you know, besides that, I, I just I really enjoyed, you know, having read some of the stuff about the filming of this particular episode and. Uh, and then seeing it, you know, play out, um, I, it's just a more enjoyable episode to me. Cool. And we'll ask the newbies the same question on our live. I just was curious what you all think. I think uh, obviously the best stuff is still to come, although some of the stronger episodes of the series we've already talked about with season two. But Kevin, you called it out earlier. Season three is your favorite season. I think it is for me, too, although I also like season four a lot. So. I'm looking forward to what comes next. And yeah, I'm not taking anything away from season four. I just, I really enjoy season three. Yep. So again, last on this is we will be back next week to talk season two one last time. And then we'll be back into it with season three the next week. So be sure again to click all the buttons and be sure to leave a review. And we want to thank all of you for coming along on this ride for 44 episodes, plus all the bonus stuff we've done. And it's an exciting time. We know we talked about it last week and this week that for the first time in over 20 years, we get a Babylon 5 movie coming. So the good stuff is just beginning. And I'm looking forward to continuing this ride. And hopefully a lot of you have joined us here with this episode and we'll continue to join on as we go too. So until next week, I've been Scott and with me has been Blake, Kevin, and Mike. And we will see you in season three. Bye. I apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry we had to defend ourselves against an unwarranted attack. I'm sorry that your crew was stupid enough to fire on a station filled with a quarter million civilians, including your own people. And I'm sorry I waited as long as I did before I blew them all straight to hell. As with everything else, it's the thought that counts.